You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, I'm Lisa Birnbach. Friends, is the world driving you mad? Do you think you're developing nervous tics every time you hear your phone ding? Are you developing nervous tics if you don't hear your phone ding or ring? Or if it's your office mate's phone? Do you want to hibernate for the next year and a half? Do you wonder if you should eat meat or plant-based burgers? Do you feel hamstrung by indecision and stress? Then join me and consider figuring out what small things make your life better. It really can help. Here are my five things this week, and maybe they'll inspire you. Who knows? Give it a whirl. Number one. Wonder of wonders, I finally performed a kind of stand-up comedy routine. Actually, I'm lying. It wasn't a comedy routine. It was more of a storytelling event. And honestly, for weeks and weeks beforehand, I was distracted and nervous. I wonder if you can tell. Now it's over, and I couldn't be more relieved. And of course, now I sort of want to do it again. I think I could have done it better, but I was good. For years and years, people have encouraged me to take the stage and do stand-up, and I prefer to be less of a joke teller and more of just kind of funny, somebody you enjoy spending time with. But when Sidney LeBlanc, who curates the Uptown Storytelling Program at the New York Society Library, approached me out of the blue last year, I just said yes. I didn't tell anybody about it. I was scared, but I thought I should do something that scares me. I felt like I was going to jump out of a plane. Uh, It went well. I mean, it went well. I'm glad I did it. Now, maybe I don't even have to do it anymore. Maybe I will. Who knows? But it was was scary. And that's saying something because I like public speaking. But that was that was a new one. Number two, Hades Town on Broadway. It's another scale altogether from a little storytelling. I saw Hades Town off Broadway a few years ago and you know, I knew it was wonderful. It was at the New York Theater Workshop, which is a wonderful incubator of theater and lots of things that they develop uh, move on. And I'm so glad Hades Town did. And it's a very modern and sort of steampunk adaptation of the uh, Greek myth of Eurydice and Persephone and Hades. And it's wonderful. Recommend, recommend. Number three, it's already sweater weather. Okay, here's the good news. I like sweater weather. The bad news is this, if we're allowed to call it Indian summer or Native American summer, whatever we call it, it just didn't last very long this year. It was kind of really disappointing. Uh, Last year, I think we weren't wearing sweaters till November, December, but we have it. Cool days are okay with me as long as the sun is out. And the sun's been out, so that's okay. Number four, may I be the last one here to extol long walks? Okay, I am. Over the long weekend, I took a long walk. And I'm actually going to go further and call it a hike. Sue me. My friend Maria was running. I was not running. I was hiking. I Got my 10,000 steps in. I loved it. I broke into a sweat. And I was going to tell you what we talked about, but she said what we said on the road stays on the road. So I'm sorry. I I may not. I want to because, you know, I'm a giver, but I can't. Uh, Number five. This is a special call out to Congresswoman Nita Lowy. Nita Lowy has served in the U.S. Congress representing New York's Westchester County since 1989. That is quite a while. In 2001 and 2, she served as the first female chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. She's been always on the side of funding PBS, for example. Ernie and Bert love her. She is the chair of the House Appropriations Committee. Mrs. Lowy just announced a few days ago that she will not be running for re-election. She's been a dynamic and passionate leader in the House, and I salute her service. Coming up, my talk with Lauren Acampora. We'll be right back. Today's guest is the author of The Paper Wasp, a novel that was released earlier this year. It is a great read, 
I can tell you because I read every word myself. The author, Lauren Akampora, is here. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I love how we found one another through a former teacher of our daughters. Yeah, you never know. You never know. What? <laughs> and, and also, she's homesteading in Vermont, right? and yet she put. She's like a media maven. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. I know. Thank you, Jennifer, out there with your chickens. Yeah, with your chickens. <laughs> So the book is essentially, the novel is, it's so interesting. It's a letter from a woman named Abby who is a little bit miserable in her miserable existence in Michigan, Mm -hmm. living at home at the age of maybe 27 or 28. Right, 27, 28, exactly. Right. So she's living at home with her parents. It's quite dysfunctional. She Mm -hmm. has a sister who is deeply dysfunctional, Mm -hmm. so she's just less disappointing. Mm -hmm. And she had tremendous promise Mm -hmm. and was one of those straight-A students who could have done something great with her life and instead is working as a cashier at a supermarket. Mm -hmm. Right. But is obsessed by her former best friend who left the same let's say, humdrum Michigan existence for Hollywood, where she is a movie star. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What a setup. Right. (laughs) Um, How did you decide to write this as a letter in the first person to one, to... You know, the book went through so many iterations, and I tried so many structures for it, and I don't think I'm alone as a novelist, as a fiction writer, in trying many things before settling upon one voice. And, uh, you know, the book began life as a short story. And I believe I wrote that in the third person uh, about these two women. And years later, a friend of mine who I had consulted about the story uh, because she worked in the tabloid industry and I needed to know about tabloids and when they were released, Uh their production uh, schedule. Uh, She always remembered that story, and maybe seven years later, she said to me just casually over lunch, uh, you know, I always think about that story about the Hollywood friend. It would make a great novel, and I think it would have a lot of commercial appeal, and I just scoffed. Commercial appeal? (laughs) Hollywood? What do I know about Hollywood? Uh, You know, I'm never going to write that as a novel, but I'm very susceptible to the power of suggestion, I'm very <laughs> it's very suggestible. Uh, so that idea never really left my mind. And the next thing you know, I had put aside the other novel I was supposed to be writing, and began to give this a shot just because it sounded like fun. And I thought it was something I'd be able to bang out in just a few weeks. I thought, oh, this will be easy. This is going to be a commercial book about Hollywood. It's going to be light. It's going to be fluffy and airy. This is a very long way of answering your question, but uh, this is how it happened. And I realized that light, fluffy, airy is clearly not my thing. It didn't work. Well, what's yeah. interesting yeah. is that it's a dark novel mm. within a, a fluffy um, uh, exterior. Right. The setup. And the I think setup, that, right. Yeah. And the, the appeal of the book, I think, to some readers is, oh, it's about female friendship. It's about Hollywood. It's about, you know, LA. It's about one person mm-hmm. having all the fame and glory and right. one person not. How did those two people make a friendship work? Yeah. Because yeah. that's kind of a real situation for Absolutely. some people. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of my favorite parts about this book. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so without giving too much away, but just enough to make people want to go and read it, um, Abby sees um, our protagonist, Abby, re-meets Elise, the movie star, mm-hmm. at their high school reunion, their mm-hmm. 10th reunion, which, which is in Michigan. And Abby, who has spent the last many years following Mm -hmm. the exploits of her famous friend through tabloids and other media, finally decides she's going to go to California and... Join Elise. Join her. Join her. Be part of this sunlit life. And and how did you research that sunlit life? The yeah. you got the landscape right, mm-hmm. you got the light right, mm-hmm. you got that sort of sense of I'm nowhere, I'm everywhere, I'm in a dream. Very dreamy. Yeah. The the 
the whole section that that starts in California. Right. Well, you know, that's what L.A. is to me. It seems like some strange dream out there in the middle of the desert, essentially, in, and and flying out. And there's a scene at the beginning of the book where Abby is on the airplane looking out the window, and she's never really traveled before. It's only her second time on an airplane. Mm-hmm. And she's never been out west, and she's looking out the window onto this topography that she's never seen before, which is just barren desert and and mountains and red rock and no roads, no civilization. And this is what it looks like yeah. flying out to L.A. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, is this oasis, this, you know, just this c- conglomeration of buildings and swimming pools and irrigation and green that really has no place out there. Right. And it seems like a strange fever dream, L.A. And I think that L.A. is not having lived out there myself, but having quite a few good friends who do and having, you know, I had a boyfriend who lived in L.A., so I spent some time there just, you know, he showed me around and I've been out a few times on vacation and such. Uh, The sense that I get is that L.A. is really whatever you want it to be. You find whatever you want to find. It's in LA. It can be dark, it can be light, it can be opportunity, it can be misery. It's just, it's kind of like New York that way. Yeah, it is. I think, though, what? there's a comedian named Mark Marin who mm-hmm. once said that it's not smog that people complain about in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. It's people's broken dreams falling right. down the, in the sky and the particles obscuring particles. the sunlight. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. It, mm-hmm. it does seem more than New York to me, but yeah, maybe more than New because York. I'm yeah. I'm a native, right? And so this just seemed normal to me, and I know right. it's not normal. But I always felt when I flew to Los Angeles, especially in the service of a book tour or something, I would get on the plane, and if if I didn't have a screenplay mapped out in my head, or a or some kind of deal fantasized, yeah, but but formal in my head Mm -hmm. that this trip was going to be a bust. Right, right. Because I I find that L.A. for me is about, was about yearning. Mm -hmm. Now I have children who live there. So it's a, they've sort of normalized what the city is for me. It's a place to see my kids. But it used to be a place of, yeah, I guess disappointment Mm -hmm. and hope Mm -hmm. and people not willing to say no, but willing to say, I'll think about right. it, and you never... Let's have another coffee. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. How long will you be here? Yeah. I'm leaving Friday. Well, could we meet next Monday? Yeah. Well, I'm leaving Friday. Right, 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 right. It'd be right. great if you could stay. Yeah, and I don't think it can be... I can't imagine it would be easy to forge a comfortable life out there, at least in that business, I think it's very difficult. And the idea of a rising starlet in Hollywood... As as much as quickly as I dismissed it when my friend mentioned that as a topic, it started to really fascinate me the more I thought about what that would be like. Well, what's interesting about Elise to me mm-hmm. is that she is, as a young actress, she has to create her brand. And yes. she doesn't really right. know what it is entirely. She's got beauty. Mm. She's got exposure. She's got fame. She's got good taste, at least. It sounds like the way she understands her image and so on. She has a cool house, but she wants to be taken more seriously as an artist. And into that... Mm -hmm into that um, uh, whole theme in the novel, you have created the rhizome and this artistic film director Mm -hmm. named Perrin. Auguste Perrin. Auguste Perrin. Okay. So the rhizome (laughs) and Auguste Perrin is a major accomplishment, Lauren. I thought it was real. I mean, I wanted it to be real yeah. so badly. So it feels could, real to me. It does? Yeah. Could you just explain what... Where uh, that all came from? Yeah, and what it, what it is yeah. and to I, our listeners. Absolutely, and I think it's all connected with what you said about, uh, you know, actresses and people in the business trying to find and express their authentic selves in a way that's brandable. Yes. And as as contradictory as that sounds, and Elise 
you know, she tries to tell her stylist, you know, I keep trying to tell my stylist I don't want cute. I don't want to be the girl next door. I want to be bohemian, authentic. I want to be authentic, she keeps saying, which is just, to me, very funny. Yeah, to me, too. To uh, me, you too. You know, with her organic cotton clothes and long, you know, unbrushed hair. And, you know, we all know those. Listen, actors. there's that there's that woman mm. in L.A. that my daughter and I laugh about called Chantel Bacon. Do mm. you know who she is? No, but I like her name. Or I think that's her name. And she has a very successful business where she markets stuff called Moon Dust or something. I think that's the name of her company. Oh, that sounds like fiction. I know it does. But she's she's an organic uh-huh. um, um, food and dust seller. And you can buy things called brain dust or sex dust or... I, I, I'm not kidding. And she talks, she gets interviewed a lot, and then people make fun of her interviews because she, you know, I like to wake up at when the moon finishes singing her song. Oh, dear. And then I yeah. like to have orgasm powder before I then have my authentic. Right. Carob, I bet that sold, I bet that sells out the orgasm. Powder, d- I'm so. sure it does. But anyway, you know what? There all publicity is good publicity. I'm sure people are all over it. Yes, yeah. Chantal Marie Bacon or Amazing. Marie. I, I don't know. Anyway, she's yeah. she she makes me laugh. Um, but <laughs> she's the real. She's a, a huge success story. I think Goop mm-hmm. is big. Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, empire mm-hmm. has has legitimized her. Sure. And this Goop, is just one step beyond. It and that's like, what right? everybody does out there. Yeah, They're yeah. looking for that authentic, uh, I, I, uh, I don't know, that epiphany. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Elise, your your yeah, actress right. in, the, in the novel, is also really struggling to yeah. figure out who she is. Mm-hmm. And she's quite lonely. Right. She's very lonely, right. which I think L.A. is, too. How could it not be, especially in that business? She doesn't trust her, quote, friends in L.A. because they're all in the business, too. And, of course, there's competitiveness and resentment. So here comes her very best friend from small town Michigan that she grew up with and trusts, and they reunite. Uh, Abby comes out there, and Elise soon finds herself asking Abby if she'll stay and be her personal assistant and give her this emotional support that she so desperately needs while she's trying to forge her place in the business and a career. Uh, And that's where the rhizome comes in. And you asked about the rhizome. The rhizome in the book is a professional development organization, for lack of a better term. A utopian one, though. Very, yeah, quite utopian, based on the teachings of Jung, uh, you know, this idea of the collective unconscious and trying and as individuals being able to access this deep well of creativity through our dreams and imagination. And so the members of the rhizome come in to this unreal stone English countryside estate in the middle of the Malibu Canyon in the desert with vines somehow on it and uh, and they work with a dream guide one on one and they engage in active imagination sessions which was something that Jung had uh, he did with his uh, with, with his, his patients, patients. Right. And so this is all based on that but it's been founded by uh, a reclusive Swiss film director very avant-garde named Auguste Perrin who very rarely comes out to L.A., but he started this organization to almost as a um, as a training for his the actors that he'll use the the cinematographers that he'll use so that he has a uh, a place to to pick from for his for his film. What's so amazing is mm-hmm. you've created this uh, enterprise, which is this dream workshopy. Mm-hmm. Elite, very, very elite yes, place very because Perrin mm-hmm. Perin won't allow just anyone yeah. to join. Right, right. And um, you have to be doing very, very well on your dream work with your one on one person. And of course, it's Elise who's a member of it, right. but it's Abby who's a passionate devotee of Perrin. Yes. And yes, she feels that they are kindred spirits. That they are kindred spirits. Mm-hmm. And she follows 
through mm-hmm. his book, not having the luxury of right. a dream counselor, she does all the work on her own. Yeah. And she does it very well. Standing at the supermarket cash register, she does active imagination sessions in Michigan. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. is incredible. Right. You're not allowed to do that in Michigan. <laughs> There's a law. And also, when you go to this this rhizome, and when you, if you can go, and if you get invited to their summer their solstice solstice costume party, party. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. if you get to um just enter the 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 fountain area the child care the manicure play i oh, mean yeah. the expensive spa I, gift shop but i love mm-hmm. that it's it's so hollywood it's so chantal marie bacon right. that you can i think it's called moon juice her company <laughs> this is Actually, just getting better and better it is pretty good i'm going to show you a picture of okay. it when we get off okay. the, in fact i'll put one on our website at lisa bernbach.com but um what what happens there it's a combination of like American Film Institute uh, and and like the Rockefeller University sure. meets I don't know what's the fanciest spot uh, Golden Door Spa I mean right. it's you've imagined a world that could exist yeah it's just so real that you would go there and spend money yeah sure maybe it's like Scientology I don't know I mean you're you're your creation of the rhizome mm-hmm. is quite mm-hmm. yeah. rich and full Thank and multidimensional. You. Many, many readers have assumed that it's real, which I, have... I love. Wow. Yeah. And they look it up to see, you know, where is this place? Can I join? <laughs> yeah, anybody would want to join. But, I think you yeah. should start it in your spare time. <laughs> um, and then Auguste Perrin. Mm-hmm director of the yeah. Happy Valley or Eureka Valley. Eureka Valley and uh, Nix Knox. That. Yeah. Oh, I saw mm-hmm, that one too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, wait, they're not real. Land of the Beings. Land of the Beings. It was really fun to name his film. Yeah. Yeah. And really fun to see them. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, all he, made uh, up. I have a very distinct picture in my mind of Auguste Perrin, and he looks, to me, he looks like a combination, very tall, very thin, sort of gaunt, I think of, and with with sort of shoulder length, white blue hair, like almost with a blue tint, very pale, spectral eyes, and uh, like a wrinkled seersucker suit, that's what he wears. Oh, Mm -hmm. interesting. I had him in more of a... Mm -hmm. a, of a turtleneck, but you're right, a wrinkled suit. Yeah. Yeah. Out in Switzerland where he almost Well, in Switzerland, yeah. 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 So, so so without I'm scared to talk too much about more about the book because I don't want to give away many secrets, but I do want to ask you about the moment in time which may or may not affect how you wrote this book in which women go very dark mm. and do some really weird things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I would include Gone Girl. I would in- and there's also a lot of sneaky subterfuge, some innocent, some pretty devilish. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm thinking of that. I'm thinking of Fates and Furies. Oh, sure. I'm thinking of The Woman Upstairs. Right, yes. Right there, we're suddenly... Do you think literature is growing up, growing up, and that women are n- not afraid to show their darker, more venal and subversive selves? I do. Yeah, and I think that it's it's interesting to me how I'm not sure. I think that the reading public is becoming more accustomed to it and appreciating this more and more. But there's still that knee jerk reaction when readers, uh, you know, encounter. A woman like this with uh, darker purposes or mm-hmm. actions to say, well, you know, she's unlikable, oh. which I find fascinating. It's so interesting because if you're reading The Paper Wasp, mm-hmm. you're you're on Abby's side for the longest time. I okay. mean, you have to like her to read uh, her story. I think you yeah. have to. You do. Yeah. One mm-hmm. one especially because she's taking you along with her sure. so openly mm-hmm. and she doesn't try to gloss over her mm-hmm. life in mm-hmm. fact if anything she makes her life look and sound more dreary than it is yeah she's she's authentic she is authentic right. she it's has her a voice. vision yeah she's a great artist mm-hmm. and she has a vision one night 
of a dress that she wants to wear to her reunion. And then she goes to Goodwill and she finds that dress. The exact dress. Yes. So she manifests mm-hmm, mm-hmm. her desires. She's a walking vision board. She's a walking vision board. <laughs> wow. Did you? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you had to like her too, right? Oh, absolutely. Well, I liked her I do, and until people, I stopped liking her. People call you stopped. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why? <laughs> so oh, even uh, even yeah. Fleischman. Yeah. Fleischman is in trouble. There are right. some very dark womanly. Yeah, I think yeah. that this is happening more and more, yeah. and I'm waiting for the day when we won't hear this word unlikable anymore, and we'll hear just hear relatable. Oh, because that's that's a pull quote for this promo. Yeah. Yes. No. It's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Because I think, and that's the that's the intention to write a character who's relatable. Otherwise, who wants to read it? If they're unrelatable, that's a sin on a writer's part to write an unrelatable character. Likable, unlikable, not so much. And some of the best, some of my favorite novels of all time have the most despicable characters uh, leading the way in the first person. I mean, Lolita. Oh my gosh! Right, oh, right. You're, Humbert is a he's monster. Despicable. He's a monster, but he's so entertaining, but enchanting. Right. And the collector. I don't know if you've read this book, John Fowles. John Fowles. Very, Very dark. Never did. Yeah. Completely entrancing all the way through. Wow. And I mean, again, a monster. Uh, what about the corrections? Yeah. Who's yeah, sure. who's good there? Yeah, right. I mean, they're just very real. These are authentic, very relatable real. characters. Right. Not, they're all flawed. And, oh, and I have to put in a plug, one of the books that I read while I was writing this book that was absolutely inspiring, and I think it's almost a perfect book, is uh, How Could She? Uh, not How Could She, sorry. That was the book we were talking about right, earlier. Right. Um, what Was She Thinking? Oh. Uh, Notes on a Scandal. Love that book book so much. By Zoe, Zoe Heller. Heller. Underrated. Should be read. The, the movie is one of gorgeous. My, one of my 10 top. Yes. You know, really? on Facebook, uh, on Facebook last yeah. year, there was a thing where you had to just show a cover of 10 books that you mm-hmm, love mm-hmm. without saying why. And I, I definitely put Zoe Heller's book on it. Well, you have I great love taste. that book. That book. Right. It's a Oh, my goodness. Sheba is the name of the young teacher. Right. What, and now I forgot the name of the main character, the older I have, woman. I have, too. But she Call her Judy Dench. Uh, oh, why not? Dame Judy Dench in that book has just the most trenchant outlook. Hilarious. Hilarious and full of bile. Oh, yeah. Just one of my favorite characters ever. Yeah. Likeable? Yeah. Eh. Relatable? Yes. Okay, this is <laughs> this is a big moment here. And let's bring this in. Well, I won't go into politics, but I don't think that it's an accident that we hear the word unlikable in politics with female politicians, right? As well, and I right. don't think, I, and, and it's interesting, and it's the women who are to blame. To blame often. Do you think that we've grown up? Do you think that's think why we're, we're ready to to yeah. take off the mask and show ourselves there. as we are? Yeah, I think this is a tipping point. Uh, I, it feels that way to me with so many books being published now with this. I think it's in the zeitgeist to this darkness and with women and and really showing women as as whole beings instead of only the public face that we're supposed to give. And we so often just really mm-hmm. are interested in the face mm-hmm. oh, or in yeah. the body. Oh, yeah. And Elise is a perfect example of what society wants from women. You know, I didn't write it as a feminist tracked, mm-hmm. but I think that my own thoughts and feelings, of, as a matter of course, come through on this tell, topic. Tell me what your process is, because mm-hmm. I think when you start with a blank page and you're creating your own world, yeah. which you get to do mm-hmm. as a fiction writer, I've heard people say they write for so many hours a day and it's clockwork. I've heard other people say they prefer to work with noise and hubbub, and some people get uh, 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 write cards with structure, and yeah. some just let it yeah. fold. What's it's your? It's so funny. Everyone has their way, and right. we all look at each other like complete aliens because we don't get how that works for someone else. <laughs> right. I mean, index cards. What do you do with them? I don't understand. <laughs> how does right. that work? What do you right. mean a bulletin board? So uh, it's it's it is pretty funny. My process, which has developed you know, willy-nilly, is just to 
I guess I start out with the blank Word document or blank notebook page, however it begins, and just write the thoughts in any way they come out. I, I, I don't understand these writers who sit down and write the first sentence of the book and then write the sen- second sentence of the book and then the third and the fourth in order. Right. I, I don't believe them that that's what they do. Right. Oh, remember <laughs> reading. I used to read, speaking of tabloids, Yeah. Um, I used to read, I remember reading an article about Jackie Collins, who was mm-hmm. a very prolific, if not literary, I mean, mm-hmm. definitely not literary writer. And she had a chaise, or maybe this is Steele, Danielle Steele, but I think it was Jackie Collins, would sit on a leopard print chaise in her leopard print negligee and write by hand her book oh, in order huh. on a stack of um, legal pads, and then her secretary would transcribe it and oh. send it straight to Simon & Schuster or something. That's so interesting because, you know, I don't write in order, but I do wear the leopard print negligee. I, th- I figured, well, you're yeah. wearing it now, so <laughs> I figured it was just your lucky lingerie. <laughs> So, you know, mine is it's very messy. I just I just write a uh, stream of consciousness on the page to get all the ideas out. And um, I often actually even write the word at the top of the document. I'll write the word free write. And that's so that if I get hit by a car and killed and someone finds my work in progress and they look at it, they know it's only a free write. Otherwise, I would die of embarrassment if I wasn't already dead. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so you've really thought it all out. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing more liberating than that word at the top of the document. What about um, hours of the day structured that way? Oh, how man. You, how you yeah. manage oh, to... Oh, I struggle with this every single day. And it's there's never enough time. There's always a competing household duties, administrative emails, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So uh, I am I try to get all of that stuff out of the way before I sit down, before I really can clear my mind to sit down and write. And it can take a long time to get to that place. Right. And we're talking around lunchtime that I can right. finally, you know, sit and focus. And I'm usually, I was always a night owl before, you know, I had a family. And uh, now I can't be. <laughs> but I'm an afternoon writer. For sure. I'm an afternoon person, not a morning person. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and I will hit the ground running usually around lunchtime and then um, panic as the school bus drop-off time approaches and then curse myself for having wasted so much time earlier in the day. Well, that sounds familiar. Yeah. And um, do you write every single day? If I can, sure, yeah. And that might take the form of note-taking. It might be researching, which is really Important. the best part. Yeah. And then uh, and then sometimes, and, and then somehow the book gets written. And I, I say that it's not magical. It's just that I really fool myself into writing sentences just by, you know, looking at the notes and fixing them and changing them until, oh, I have, this, I have a paragraph. How did that happen? And then, okay, you know, it's wow. to sit down and write sentences one after another is so intimidating. So it's just this kind of from the inside out. Wow. Scu- it's almost like sculpting. Like, but it yeah. sounds like a yeah. lot of work. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it is a lot of work. After it's done, I thought, when did I do that? I don't even remember writing this. Yeah, it's wow. very, it, because it doesn't well, feel like flow. work. It doesn't feel like work. Right, right. I mean, it's. It's exasperating, but somehow what it's happens when the phone rings? Paradox. Do you, do you answer it when you're writing? Yeah, you do. Oh, I'm very easy easy to interrupt. Yeah, wow, right. it's terrible. And the internet is the worst of all. See, when I'm writing yeah. um, something, mm-hmm. not a blog or a tweet, I'm um, I try to. I mean, you need the internet on, mm-hmm. but I try not to go to the internet. Mm. I guess there are ways you can. You have more willpower than I do. Oh, really? You go on I all need, the time. I need to Email. have. I need one of those programs that shuts me out. No, I do too. But I'm sort of. I'm. I've sort of done it in my own mm-hmm. way. Yeah, it's. You know, it, it gets done eventually. I think I could be a lot faster if I learned how to yeah. control myself. Yeah. But, but you know, with the internet, though, how did people write books before the internet? I really. I mean. How well, little did lady. Fictions? Well, little lady, <laughs> let me tell you. What was really great about writing pre internet, young lady, was that as you, it's true, you had to keep putting a new sheet of paper in your typewriter. 
True. So you could say that was interrupting, but it really wasn't if you had an electric typewriter. I found, I wrote my first book, The Preppy Handbook, on a typewriter, and I could just fly because you didn't edit and right. try to move things around and perfect your words. Yeah. You just get your stuff out there and then go back and rework it. Oh, I get that. What I and mean is... there was yeah. no... and. Oh, research? Research. There's a thing we used to have. The library? <laughs> yeah. We used to go to a place right. called the library. We used to use a thing called the telephone, mm. where you call people and mm -hmm. say, excuse me, I'm right. inquiring about hmm, your plaid. How much does your plaid cost by the yard? What... What is the, uh, how much is tuition at your school? You know, you call yeah. people and you go to libraries. I think more and people write books now because of the internet. Well. What do you think? Because they can research um, yeah. so much more easily. They don't have to. I know. think people should. I, I mean, I think research. Yeah. Uh, again, this is my thing that people are isolated and doing research which required a librarian or a phone call to an expert or someone was kind of better because you could talk things out. Mm -hmm. Oh, is this really what you meant? Mm -hmm. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm glad we clarified blah, blah, blah. But now you go online by yourself. You look up something. You find it. Maybe if it's some week, if, it, if you can only find answers on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I find that's a problem because mm -hmm. I don't trust Wikipedia. There are mm -hmm. a lot of boo-boos. Mm -hmm. But it's isolating. Yeah. It's isolating. I, I mean, I'm not saying that people should all go to the library now and mm -hmm. and that takes time away from sitting at your desk. Yeah, but, it sure does. Yeah. You know, I wrote a short story in my first book about a neurosurgeon and let me tell you, it was a lot easier to research that with the internet than it would have been to go oh. to a neurosurgery to, to gain yeah. access to an operating room. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't the most fun research I've ever done looking at these pictures and videos of uh, brain, brain surgery. surgery. Wow. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, there's just there's infinite information for fiction no, writers. Not to mention something that fiction writers don't talk about, but I know that they all use is Google Street View. Oh, mm -hmm. look at that! Yeah. I never even thought about that. Right? Because yeah. So I, in creating your your environment geographically, oh. it's fantastic. No so, to self. I mean, yes. I mean, of course, that doesn't replace going somewhere. I mean, you mentioned Los Angeles and the light and the. I mean, of course, I had to be in you Los had Angeles. To go, but you also right. had to go to Michigan. Yes, which I do all the time because my husband grew up in Western Michigan. Ah, yeah, yeah. So I go there at least twice a year, and for the last fifteen years, so I've gotten to know that you know organically that region. Ah, but excellent. Uh, but yeah, but after coming home from Los Angeles and thinking, oh, wait a minute, what does Hollywood Boulevard look like again? I I know I have pick. I know I can remember it, but I need to see that block. Google Street View. Wow. Yep. Yep. Just go and and, and it's like you're there. You're giving away all the secrets I know. of the craft. Shh. <laughs> My guest is Lauren Akampora. Her novel, The Paper Wasp, is a great read. I'm sure it'll make a great movie, Lauren. You know, it's funny you should say that. Just yesterday, the book was optioned for TV. TV. How fantastic. Thank you. This yes. is the TV decade. Brian Cranston right? told us so. Yeah, well... Fingers crossed. Wow. Yeah, we'll see what will happen. So, oh, I have, it's t oh, it's going to happen. Yeah. Everybody who goes on this podcast gets a TV or movie deal. I swear to you. Oh, it's good luck. It's good luck. All actually, right, well, thank you. I can't prove the causality, but I know it's there. <laughs> I definitely do. Well, I'm. Uh, I recommend that people pick this up if you want to read about a world that you think you know about. And Hollywood takes out a whole different uh, cast in this novel of female friendship. I was going to say there's a little single white female aspect mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. it. It'll just surprise you, which is the gift of this book. Lauren, having said all that, I feel like saying, would you accept this, Rose? <laughs> having said all that, let's go into your five things. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Which so, are really not related to this book at all, are they? No, I guess they don't need to, to be. No, they don't mm -hmm. need to be. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Number one. Airbnb is oh. the first thing that came to mind when I 
I heard, what are the top five things that make my life better? Right. Oh, my gosh, Airbnb. It's such a great invention for travelers. Yes, it is. Yeah. If you get lucky. I mean, I yeah. shouldn't say that. I've never not been lucky, knock on wood. Oh, I've had some. Yeah? I've had some places that yeah. weren't great. But but it is a great concept, oh, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's opened up so, so many more opportunities for travel and for better travel. And for places that don't have it, hotels. Right. Right. Yeah, I think about, you know, we took a family trip to Iceland a few years ago. And, I mean, in the middle of nowhere, where, where are they going to put a hotel? In, right. We're in the middle of Iceland with no town. Right. But there's a house, there's a room, and now we have a, you know, a suite to stay in with a, a kitchen. Amazing. Wow. So it's just, it's opened up, you know, neighborhoods and cities that might not have been accessible for right. travelers, rural places, uh, you know, houses where we can meet our friends and all, you know, have vacation together in Dublin in a beautiful neighborhood. You know, and and it's affordable. Yeah. I mean, I know that it's not great for, you know, cities necessarily. I know that it's been changing the character of some neighborhoods like Barcelona is, you know, having what a is problem. It, is it riven with Airbnb? Well, there's Airbnb. so many Airbnbs in certain, you know, in some of the Gothic Quarter in Barcelona that it's really changing the character of the neighborhood and people are having to move out. And it's a problem oh, for wow. some places. Yeah. But for travelers, it's, I mean, a godsend. It's been, it is great. Yeah. I had to, uh, when one of my kids was going to school overseas, I mm. found an Airbnb around the corner from her dorm, Amazing. which was really yeah. great. Right. It was great. And then when I wanted to stay there again, it was booked for the... Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. it was great. But but it, when it works, it works. It, it works. Right. And I have friends who rented a place in Florence that was a giant, beautiful, and critically air-conditioned mm, loft mm -hmm. right in the center of mm -hmm, everything, mm -hmm. and it was so much less than the hotels. Right, and so much more character. Right. And then you get to know the hosts often, and that can really enhance the experience of being right. in a place. And having that human connection, it's just a more human scale than the hotel chains and more comfortable and warmer. And this is not sponsored by Airbnb. Right. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> Rescue dogs, especially mine. What uh, kind yes. do you have? I do not know. He is some kind of dog. Yeah. That's all I know. He's a, he's a mix, I think a little retriever. He's like a mini red retriever. He's like the little red dog is what a he is. A little red dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, his name is Augie. Aww. I miss him already. He's so, I'm become, I, mean, I mean, we got him in, in February, and I instantly became one of those people. It happens, right? Instantly. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh, these people with the dogs and the rescue dogs. Oh, okay. Now I'm one of them. Yes, so I'm right. always try, I'm always proselytizing to friends, you know, you know, adopt, don't shop. You have yeah. to go. I mean, there's. it's just so heartbreaking, these I shelters. Know. And he came from a high kill shelter in North Carolina. And I just, I look at this sweetheart and think... Who oh, would do that to right, you? Right. I know. And it's just, it's such a problem in this country. And just to, even just rescuing one dog, just looking at him makes me happy. See, and I had I had a dog who, who died in December, but what oh, I used sorry. to say, thank you, I used to say, who rescued whom? That's right. You see those bumper stickers. Oh, there are bumper stickers? Oh, there I are. I thought I made that up. No, there are. Who rescued who? It's actually the wrong uh, grammar. Who rescued who is what it says. Well, instead it of should whom. be whom. Yeah, it should, but, you know. People are idiots. Okay. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> Okay. Number three. Yeah. Okay. Those little supermarket shopping carts. Okay. Which kind? Do you know what I, I'm talking about? I don't. And okay. I'm and that might be know. because you live here in the city, and I don't think they have these here. But this might be a suburban phenomenon. But uh, okay. Imagine, you know, the big, the regular shopping cart, regular yes. size shopping yes. cart that you have to maneuver through right. the aisles, and you're banging into people, and, and there's no room have, for it. You can't. Um, there's not room for two of them in an aisle. Right. 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 I mean, who invented this size? Uh, anyway. Now, within the last several years, there these new shopping carts have appeared, which are like snub-nosed versions, double-decker, oh, short little ones. I like those. That make me disproportionately happy. They have them at Trader Joe's, I think. Oh, see, I wouldn't be surprised. Trader they're Joe's. They're really... Yeah, they're, they're great. great. They, they're great. Also, I... <laughs> Also, I don't like to put things in the bottom, which is right. weird. Oh, that is weird. 
um, because I'm very lazy. I don't yeah. want to uh, crouch. But yeah. I put, if I have stuff with me before I go to the supermarket, oh, okay. I put all that in the bottom. Oh, that's interesting. And then I yeah, we do all my have shopping. Yes, exactly. And, you know, supermarket I and mean, food shopping takes up so much of our time and our existence. And it's something I really don't love doing. And it's always too cold in the supermarket, and there are too many choices. So yeah. something as simple as this little shopping cart just really does it makes my life so much better. Yeah. I put the, the big, heavy things on the bottom and then the smaller things I on top. I think that's probably yeah. as God meant it to be. <laughs> but I'm an extremely, I mean, very uh, neurotic food shopper where I have the you know the bags that I bring and I bag all my own things and oh, I have yeah. a very clear system about what goes in which bag and they all think I'm insane. Oh no, I know a lot of people who do it that way. I know a lot of yeah. people and and we're all going to get to the point where we bring our own produce bags. Oh yes. And yes. I saw a guy at uh-huh. Fairway doing that the other mm-hmm. day and I almost thanked him for it and then I thought, you know, he's probably no, this is the vanguard. Yes. Give it another year. Oh, I know. Yeah, we're almost there. We are very close. Yeah. Not close enough, but anyway. Yeah. Number four. I love your number four. Oh, okay. Yes. Audiobooks in the car, but not just any audiobooks. Nonfiction audiobooks. And the reason I make that distinction is because I find listening to fiction and reading fiction to be very different experiences. And listening to fiction just can't be a substitute to me for reading it on the page. Reading fiction on the page, I need to read the sentences more than once. It's a beautifully written sentence. I need to, you know, if there's a different, to me, it's a different thought process uh, reading on the page versus listening. I don't think, I, I joined Audible mm-hmm. after a long, long time of not joining Audible, and I've mostly downloaded memoirs, and mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever listened to a novel. Okay. I have downloaded some very long classic books, like The Mill on the Floss is in my library. There's some hmm. old, old big books, mm-hmm. maybe worn pieces in my audio thing, but um, Q. But so far, I've only listened to nonfiction because, yeah. I don't know, uh, you don't need to be in the moment. You can stop and go. That's right, yeah. With a novel, if you're in it, you need to read it until that's right. Yeah, the, the moment passes or yeah. the experience comes to a close or yeah. the chapter yes. is a it, yeah. I agree. So, I agree. Yeah. So in the car, I mean, long trips, short trips, whatever. You so know. you and your family listen together? No, just me. Ah, yeah. This is this is a solitary experience for me when I'm driving, and uh, the the books that I've chosen, I've been really happy with. Memoirs read by the author yes. in particular. Yes. Uh, Patty Smith's book, Just Kids. Oh, I read that as a book. Yeah. It's oh, great I, hearing her voice. Oh, I bet it is. Yeah. I bet it uh-huh. is. David Sedaris. Yes. Hilarious. You have to listen to David Sedaris' right? voice. David Lynch's memoir, Room to Dream. I cannot get enough of David Lynch's voice. Wow. His Midwestern His voice. His Midwestern voice. Love him. And he's my favorite director. So, wow. I mean, I could listen to that book on repeat like forever. Wow. One of my favorite books um, was to listen to by the author was <laughs> The Kid Stays in the Picture by Robert oh, Evans. Oh, I bet that's good. He says, you bet your ass. <laughs> All the time. It made me laugh. You can almost feel a gold chain around That's great. his neck. Yeah. Okay, and number five. Number five, my small town and its library. So we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, about my town, which is this very small, it's a very small hamlet within the town of Bedford, New York. It's a town called Katona. And I think it only has technically something like 1,500 people who live in Katona proper. Hmm. It's a small town. And it doesn't feel like part of Bedford in the way, you know, that some neighborhoods do. It feels like its own little entity. Very small geographically, one elementary school, and everybody knows each other, and it's just this sort of idyllic little town. It feels, I always compare it to Bedford Falls from It's a Wonderful Life. Ah, And yes. that's, you know, that's what I have always, I've always wanted to live in a, I, actually, I didn't know I always wanted to live in a place like that until I spent 12 years in New York City. Yeah. And I was done with the city, and 
uh, moving there has really changed my outlook. I've just become so much less cranky and less neurotic than I was living in the city. It's, um, it's a really nice counterpoint to being alone at home writing. When you go into town, you walk down the street, you know, you know your pharmacist, you know yeah. the post office clerk, you know the grocery store they clerk. They know you. Yeah. They know Augie. They, exactly. Yeah, Augie's famous in town. I'm sure. And you run into five friends on the street, and if you go to the library, you'll never leave because everybody now is there, and you know all the librarians, and they're talking about how's your book, how's your writing, and it's just, it's it feels really warm and comforting and um, supportive. Uh-huh. People know each other, and then it makes it easier to go home and be alone and right. just go inward, inward and write dark books. Yeah, that's my... That's my little town. I do love it. I've been there for 10 years, and I think it's pretty perfect. Oh, this is a great list, Mm -hmm. and it's been a great opportunity getting to know you a little bit and getting to know you a little bit more through the book. The book, again, is The Paper Wasp. Lauren, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been Lauren at Compora, author of The Paper Wasp, published this past June by Grove Atlantic Press, soon to be a TV movie. You can follow Lauren on her website at laurenatcompora.com or on Twitter at Lauren at Compora. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, YouTube, and iHeartRadio. And if you don't mind, and if you like it, please rate it. That helps us. I don't know how, but it does. My blog is at lisabernbach.com. And go there, and you'll find links and photos to things that we talked about today. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Jimmy Regan. My team is Espresso Urucci, Michael Port, Boko Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, stay cool and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday. If she remembers. 